Hello everyone, the long wait is finally over. This is Rape Hysteria, part two. In part one of our history lesson, we looked at two infamous rape scandals. The first one at Duke University, and the second at the University of Virginia. Both were modern examples of the inherently toxic idea of guilty until proven innocent in action. <laughs> But this mentality of guilty until proven innocent has been around far before either of these cases. It has a long and violent history, which we'll examine in this video. In the words of the great philosopher George Santayana, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. In the year 1692, two young girls from Salem Village began having fits and contortions, and soon afterward, other girls began acting in a similar manner. While much of their behavior can now be explained with modern science, in the 1600s they labeled what they couldn't understand as supernatural. The two girls eventually blamed three women in the village of bewitching them. And after days of interrogation, with the same questions being asked over and over, one of the women, a slave named Tatuba, finally caved in. She spun an elaborate story involving demonic animals, flying broomsticks, and a dark man with a book full of names of witches in the village. Of course, there's never any evidence for this story, but the accusation was all the evidence they needed. After that, accusations of witchcraft spread across the village, and over time, people from nearby communities were also accused. Overall, hundreds were accused of practicing witchcraft, and hundreds were imprisoned, some for months on end without a trial. Thankfully, not everyone was so quick to believe these unfounded accusations. Some people desired stronger evidence and felt there should be a presumption of innocence. Increase Mather, an influential minister and the president of Harvard wrote, It were better that ten suspected witches should escape than that one innocent person should be condemned. Unfortunately though, being skeptical could prove deadly. A tavern owner named John Proctor was openly critical of the entire witch hunt. But, as punishment for being the voice of reason, Proctor was accused of being a witch himself leading to him being hanged. After about a year of madness though, the witch hunt finally came to an end. Everyone accused was released from prison and the authorities in Salem admitted they were wrong. But the damage was already done. 19 people convicted of witchcraft were hanged. At least four accused of being witches died in prison, one man was pressed to death under heavy stones, and even two dogs were killed under suspicion of helping witches. Now thankfully, witch hunting in the western world died by the 18th century. However, the same flawed primitive reasoning used to justify witch hunting continued to live on. In the 1950s, America had a new fear. Communism. In February 1950, Wisconsin Senator Joseph McCarthy gave a speech claiming that 205 communists had infiltrated the State Department. Despite his lack of evidence for this claim, the accusation on its own was enough to launch McCarthy into the national spotlight, giving him a surge of public support. And as McCarthy's power grew, so too did his unfounded accusations. Government employees, teachers, scholars, people in the media, and others were accused and aggressively interrogated. Many lost their jobs and were publicly condemned, even though there was no proof it had communist affiliation. This era of paranoia and persecution came to be known as McCarthyism. Thankfully, there were people willing to stand up to McCarthy, like the journalist Edward R. Murrow. But whenever someone criticized McCarthy, he would just accuse them of being a communist sympathizer. McCarthy eventually bit off more than he could chew, though, when he targeted the U.S. Army on charges of communist infiltration. This led to the 36-day-long Army McCarthy hearings in 1954. It was because of these televised hearings that McCarthy lost most of his support, with the public realizing how absurd his accusations were. Chief Counsel for the U.S. Army, Joseph N. Welch, famously said to McCarthy, You've done enough. Have you no sense of decency, sir? At long last, have you left no sense of decency? From that point forward, McCarthy's fame and power dwindled, with the Senate finally condemning him later that year. Sadly though, McCarthyism hasn't been the final manifestation of guilty until proven innocent. The 80s brought upon yet another moral panic surrounding child abuse and Satanism. In California in 1983, the mother of a two and a half year old boy made a phone call to the Manhattan Beach Police Department, accusing a school aide named Ray Bucky of molesting her son at McMartin Preschool. Never mind that the child could not point out Ray in photos. Never mind that medical investigations showed no signs of sexual abuse. Never mind that the mother 
made claims which defied reality like Ray flew in the air. Never mind that she was eventually found to be a paranoid schizophrenic. The evidence, or lack thereof, would not get in the way. Ray Bucky was arrested, and then police sent a letter warning parents about Ray and the horrible things he could be doing to their children. Naturally, the parents were terrified and demanded a full-scale investigation of McMartin Preschool. The children who went to the preschool were then handed over to social workers and therapists who tried to pressure them into saying they were abused. At first, the children would deny seeing any abuse occur. But over time, with the use of suggestive questions, insults, bribery, and other coercion tactics, the therapists got the answers they clearly wanted. Seven members of McMartin Preschool, including Ray Bucky, were indicted on numerous counts of child sexual abuse. Children testified that they were photographed while playing games naked. They also claimed that sexual assaults took place at locations like farms, circus houses, car washes, and even a secret room at the preschool which could only be accessed by a tunnel. And the testimonies only got more bizarre from there. One boy spoke of animal sacrifices and being forced to drink the animal's blood. Another boy said they were forced to dig up coffins at a graveyard, and then the McMartin teachers would open the coffins and hack the bodies with knives. What all these accusations had in common was that there was no proof any of them were true. They even went so far as to dig for these supposed tunnels and nothing was ever found. But still, that wouldn't get in the way. Unskeptical news reports continued to push the satanic child abuse narrative. We believe the children became the slogan of the emotionally driven movement. Seven years and 15 million taxpayer dollars later, the McMartin preschool trial was the longest and most expensive criminal trial in American history, and ultimately, it led to no convictions. What it did do, however, was emotionally scar hundreds of children destroyed the lives of McMartin staff and put an innocent man in jail for five years. And McMartin Preschool wouldn't be the last time this happened. The hysteria surrounding sexual abuse and satanic rituals continued to spread throughout the 80s until it eventually died off in the early 90s. It's understandable though why people would be so quick to believe the children. In their minds they must have thought, why would a child lie about sexual assault? Just like how today the question would be, why would a woman lie about rape? Well, perhaps because she's after attention. Perhaps because a man didn't want a long-term relationship with her. Perhaps because she was mad that her parents divorced. Perhaps to get revenge on her ex-boyfriend. Or to win back her ex-boyfriend. Perhaps to cover up cheating on her husband. Perhaps because she feels guilty about sleeping with her friend's son. Perhaps to gain sympathy from her partner. Perhaps because the sex was bad. Perhaps as an excuse for failing her exams. Perhaps to explain why she's looking at porn. It can be for the most trivial reason. And while innocent men lose years of their lives behind bars, some people choose to bury their head in the sand. Like Karen Smith, executive director of the Sexual Assault Center of Edmonton, who dismissively claimed that false rape accusations just don't happen. Or the actress Lena Dunham, who tweeted to her millions of followers that women don't lie about rape. Or Anna Marie Cox, a political columnist and culture critic, who had this to say during the rape scandal at UVA. Anyone who, anyone who thinks that women are out there reporting, you know, doing false reports of rape needs to ask the woman closest to them in their lives about this. Ask a woman that you know if she would do that, or if she thinks that other women would do that, and you will get the answer no. Now, obviously, not all women lie about rape. Most women don't lie about rape. Rape is a serious and ongoing problem in this country, and the rest of the world as well. But the oppression of women does not justify oppressing innocent men in return. Guilty until proven innocent is not solving the problem, it's creating a new one. We have to understand that when a false allegation of rape is made, it can change a young man's life forever. And false accusations aren't always deliberate. It can also be a matter of getting the wrong man. Like Luis Lorenzo Vargas, who spent 16 years in prison after falsely being identified as the teardrop rapist. Or Daryl Pinkins, who spent over 24 years in prison for a rape he didn't commit. That's over a quarter of his life he can never get back. So as you've seen, guilty until proven innocent has a long record of failure. But the mentality from its advocates is, hey, it'll work this time. If our society cares not only about justice but also the truth, then we need to be sure the people we punish are guilty. We must approach these accusations with a critical mind, ready to evaluate the evidence as it comes out. To conclude this video, I have a very simple question for you. 
If you were accused of rape, or any other crime for that matter, and you knew you were innocent, would you rather live in a world where everyone assumed you were guilty? Or would you prefer everyone remain neutral until evidence came forward?